Well, it's the late 19th century in Saskatchewan here at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, and they're selling whatnots in the furniture store across the street. But it's just the beginning for the Canadian Museum of History. I'm joined now by Heritage Minister James Moore. And this is about a lot more than just changing the name, putting out a press release and going home. You're really refocusing the museum. Yeah, you know, this year we start the five-year countdown to 2017, Canada's 150th birthday. The Museum of Civilization here in the national capital is the largest of Canada's museums. It's over a million square feet. Uh, and what we want to do is make this institution that's been really great for a lot of years, had 1.3 million visitors last year, and make it bigger, make it better, and focus it on Canada's history. The United States has the Smithsonian, Australia has a Museum of History, Germany has a Museum of History, and I think Canada deserves to have an institution like that. So we have this large national museum, and we're going to refocus it, give it a new mandate, Date as the, it's, the new title is the Canadian Museum of History. And what we're going to do is we're going to tie together all of Canada's museums across the country that have a similar mandate to talk about history and bring them all together so we can get a lot of the artifacts that are here and move them around the country and talk about, more about Canada's history one to another as we head towards our 150th birthday. And one of the things I know you're enthusiastic about, as with most museums, they've got a lot more than they can display. The museum, and this, the War Museum is institutionally a part of it, has an incredible treasure trove in the vaults. Yeah, th this museum, not, not including the War Museum, but the Museum of Civilization, soon to be the History Museum, um, has 3.5 five million artifacts in its holdings and even though this museum is over a million square feet they still about 80 percent of it is in storage and that's a shame because we've got there's some amazing things in, in, in the holdings here we've got they just authenticated the last spike that was driven into my home province of British Columbia just outside of Kamloops in 1885 to bring British Columbia into confederation we've got John A. McDonald's pocket watch they've got all kinds of incredible treasures we have Terry Fox's van we've got uh, Samuel de Champlain's astrolab amazing things rocket Richard's jersey his 50-50 stick, 50 goals and 50 games. So there's all kinds of, br of brilliant Canadian stories to be told and we want to get that stuff moving around the country and get more of it out there because um, not everything should be about Ottawa. Uh, I, I hate to say that often too with some of my friends uh, who, are, who are members of Parliament or, or friends in the Ottawa area but this has been a great museum. They've benefited from it and we want to move stuff around the country and what's equally true is that little museums all across the country have some incredible uh, items in their collection. I, I was struck, I told the story uh, uh, the other day about how in Midway, British Columbia, which is a small little town, exactly where you think it is, midway along the border between uh, the Pacific Ocean and the province of Alberta, right along the U.S. border, and they've got a little museum there, and they have uh, a really impressive display, touching display, on Japanese internment, uh, which in British Columbia was, was very much in the Okanagan, and a lot of Japanese Canadians who decided to stay in the South Okanagan um, and continue to live there and raise their families there, they put together a display that's really lovely, and I saw this, and I thought to myself, more people should see this, but it's in this little museum in the middle of British Columbia and what we want to do with this big beautiful national museum is have all these small museums tie in institutionally to this bigger museum so we can share collections and move them around the country. Yeah and this you, you're talking about strengthening Canadian culture sense of identity it's not just a matter of of showing things here and there but it's the museums themselves, if they can draw on the artifacts that the Canadian Museum of History has, this is going to help them attract visitors, make them stronger institutionally. Another example, um, in Port Moody, where I'm from, uh, my hometown, we have the Port Moody Station Museum, because Port Moody was the original terminus of the CP line uh, at the time of Confederation. And they've, we've, it's a great little museum, it's right in downtown Port Moody, right in, right in the waterfront there, and they've got some great stuff, but it's been static, it's been there for about 30 years, and so those of us in Port Moody have kind of, we've seen it, and we're proud of it, and we like it. Um, but imagine a local museum like that being able to host um, stuff related to the War of 1812, which our government has talked a lot about this year, or being able to, to host Samuel de Champlain's Astrolab. Uh, and uh, and then the museum can host it, and local schools could then do a lesson plan around it, and then bring kids in that week and actually see it and have a lecture there from a prominent historian who can tell them about the importance of this piece of Canada's history and actually be in contact in a, in a, in a real way with a part of our history. And imagine that multiplied across the hundreds of museums around the country on an ongoing basis in connection with the National Museum. And it really will do what you know what you, you at Sun have talked about for a very long time, which is you know we see these polls all the time about especially young Canadians who don't know a lot about our history and the Historica Dominion Institute does these surveys and studies about how Canadians can't name a lot of our, especially young Canadians can't name a lot of our prime ministers and stuff and we can do better and by having now the infrastructure to share collections, move them around, have local museums, build local thematics that make sense and teach kids things, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to breathe real life into our local museums and 
talked about talk about money, um, allow them to do some fundraising as well, so they can be more self-sustaining and rely a little less on the taxpayer. I think that's a good thing too. Yeah, you can't ignore that. And I think often museum curators, especially big museums, part of the heartbreak is you've got so much you can't show, yeah. and thus it'll be nice for them to to realize the stuff's going to travel, but. Speaking of, of the selection issue, some people are saying, yeah, but what about you know those exhibits they did on Egypt and the Mayans? Is that all going to fall by the wayside? No, the, the museum that's here is, is iconic, and, and there will be a lot of flexibility still. I mean, the, the floor space that they have, half of it is going to change, half of it is going to stay the same. The half that stays the same are uh, the, the places for international exhibits, because you also want to draw people in with other stuff so that maybe they'll come on to the other parts of the museum and learn a little more about Canada's history. So the flexible floor space for international exhibits will stay as it is. The IMAX, the will stay as it is. The First Peoples exhibit in the Grand Hall, that'll stay as it is. It's, it's well regarded and it's, it also reminds us as well that Canada's history doesn't begin in 1867, even though this is part of a Canada's 150th birthday project for 2017, that we have a history that goes much further uh, prior to that. Um, so those things will stay. But what will change is the Postal Museum that's here that um, in a diplomatic way can use some freshening up and uh, this here the, the Canada Hall which has some pretty cool stuff and, and some some great artifacts um, it can use a fixing up and a better telling of Canada's a more thorough telling of Canada's story this hasn't been improved in almost 30 years and and um, and again I just think we can do better now the, the mention of the fact that this history didn't begin in 1867 raises a very important point which we're going to come back to after the break more on the Canadian Museum of History after this Welcome back. We're here at the Canadian Museum of Civilization talking to Heritage Minister James Moore about the museum's impending transformation into the Canadian Museum of History. And when you're making a museum of history, you have to decide what story to tell, how to tell it, how far back it goes, and so on. And some people have raised the question, well, isn't this all just propaganda? You know, are we going to get there and find out Stephen Harper invented the telephone? <laughs> I assume there are safeguards in place. Did he? Tell me. Did he? No. no um, look, the, the, the Museums Act, uh, which is what we're going to amend in legislation in Parliament in order to create this museum and give it a new mandate, actually very explicitly says that the minister and the prime minister and parliamentary, we can't tell the museum what they can or can't show. I can't come in here and say, take that painting down or show that instead of that. Uh, I'm prohibited from doing that. What we do is we set out a broad mandate, and then they have a professional staff here, and they have a board of directors and a president who, who make the day-to-day -day decisions about what they do show. But there's no question there are parts of our history that are controversial. I mean, this was seen actually at the at the War Museum. Two things actually that happened at the War Museum when it was when it was first created. One was they have Hitler's car, and a lot of people in Canada's Jewish community said, "Why would we, why in the world would we show that?" Um, and Jack Granistein, who was the original chair of the museum, said, well, there are reasons why. It's, it's part of the narrative. And, and it was very controversial at the time. Um, but they dealt with it, and we had a conversation about it. You deal with the controversy, you move forward. The second controversy they had was the way in which the language in which they were choosing to talk about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at the, which led to the end of the Second World War, and the language that they used, which sparked a good deal of controversy. But I think, you know, we're a, we're a tough country. We're made of stern stuff, and we can have those kind of conversations. You know, there'll be obviously great debates about how and the way in which we present and talk about Louis Riel at this museum. How we talk about our, our Aboriginal people. How uh, do we talk about uh, uh, residential schools, uh, Japanese internment, as you said, uh, Chinese head tax. I mean, there, there are there are points of Canada's history, even for even stuff that's more contemporary. Uh, the 1970 uh, uh, attacks in Quebec, uh, the 80 rev referendum, the 95 referendum. H how do we talk about these things? Um, yeah, they're controversial, but that's not a good thing. And the fact that we're prepared to debate them, I think, is a sign of our strength. Yeah, in fact, I'll take Hitler's car as an example. To me, it's an eerie feeling to look at the car and know that this emblem of evil was a human being. That he, he sweated into that leather and so on. That they, he was a person, that people are the way this kind of evil comes into the world. And also because we're going to go back before 1867 and there's the existing exhibit on, on the Aboriginals, we're going to have to talk about the collision between Europe and aboriginals and the, the tragedies that resulted from that and you, you can't change your history, but by understanding your history, you can change your future. Yeah, and, and look, it, and often with a lot of these questions, the job of a museum isn't to drive a sympathy, it's to create an empathy, right? And so when you when you just have a dialogue and a conversation about these things, a lot of Canadians don't necessarily approach uh, a subject matter, for example, like residential schools or Japanese internment, and they don't necessarily approach them and just say, I want to go there and learn about it so I can take a strong stand. Very often people want to go and they want to learn about it so they can understand it and they can say, well, from that perspective, I get that perspective. From that 
understanding, I can understand that perspective, and you can understand why things are controversial. Not everything is necessarily driven to an absolute point. I mean, there are truths and there are facts of our history that need to be understood, obviously, and, and known and learned, but, but very often our, our history and the way in which we think about them often depends on your point of view. And, and just having this infrastructure now, and this is the big point though, is that having a Canadian Museum of History tied together with local museums, we now have the infrastructure to have those conversations. We, there will never be absolute full agreement across the country in a lot of these controversial questions, but we shouldn't avoid them. And we've been avoiding them for too long because we don't have the institutions. Well, now we have the institutions. Let's talk about them. We're adults. We can have the conversation. Our kids can handle it. And it'll only make us stronger because we talk about it. Yeah. And from my own perspective, I hope we go back from 867 back from 1867 back to about 867 to go back into the roots of our liberty in Britain the dark ages Alfred of Wessex Magna Carta I'd love to have Magna Carta tour we can really get into all that stuff even if some people are going to come and say no this is nothing to do with us we can at least bicker about it yeah no I, I think that that's exactly the right uh, right approach and and there'll be a lot of things for this new museum and for the board of directors to wrestle about I was on a radio show this morning uh, uh, in, in Quebec and they said you know was is Quebec going to be guaranteed a quarter of the foot space so we could talk about Quebec history as and I said, well, I'm from British Columbia. We're 15% of Canada's population. We're not going to have 15% for, like, that's not the way I think to approach these things. I think um, Quebec's history is Canada's history and vice versa. And the museum will have a lot of these things. But I actually think, you know, when you start having these conversations, for someone who's a passionate, uh, you know, pursuer of, of books and things about Canada's history, you start to realize that it gets, gets exciting very fast when you think about the ways in which this museum can talk about these things and wrestle with these things and think about approaching them and presenting them and debating them. And uh, to me, it's, it's, it's going to be very exciting. You know, this museum has a long history. It was created originally, its pedigree goes back to 1856. It was the originally the geological survey. In 1968, it was turned by the Liberals into the Museum of Man, very unpolitically correct. Uh, yeah. Yes, and then, uh, and then it was turned into the Museum of Civilization in 86 before it got its physical new home here in 1989. So this is a museum that has had changes over time, but it's always been building. And I think, you know, we're a G8 nation. We're proud of our history. We should be damn proud of our history because it's rich and, and, and very vibrant. And uh, now we'll have a truly pan-Canadian institution to talk about these things. Right, and you've been talking about the need for debate and discussion, and this isn't just a matter of coming and jeering at an exhibit or clapping at it. Part of the, this process is going to be consultations with Canadians yeah. about what should be included in terms of themes, events, perspectives, timelines and all that. Yeah, that's right, because it's not my museum. It's not Stephen Harper's museum. It's a Government of Canada museum that we're responsible for in trust for Canadian taxpayers. It's Canadians' museum. And if people want to get involved in that, I really do and hope that they do. And if they Google uh, museum, Canadian Museum of Civilization, which is the current name of the museum until we uh, change it with, through an act of parliament, Google Canadian Museum of Civilization and you'll see a link there that'll take you to online consultations to talk about the museum and its future. And a lot of Canadians have ideas about what should or shouldn't be in and the kind of narrative that we should talk about. And there's actually a, a, a good way to think about it. People who have visited other museums around the country, um, you know, you can do a chronological pursuit of Canada's history, maybe starting in 867 or prior to that. Uh, you can take a chronological, you can take a thematic, you could take a regional uh, approach to the museum. And there, there are all kinds of different ways that the museum can tackle these questions. And um, it, it's a great discussion. And it's good. And now we have a home for it. And uh, we're putting, as you know as well, a lot of money into this as well. This is a $25 million one-time investment from the Government of Canada. But as a also as a fiscal hawk I am and uh, who's, who's done a lot of budget cutting in my department I can tell you that all the money as well comes from within the existing envelope within my department so there there's uh, no new taxpayers money this has all been budgeted prior before it's just rearranging the Department of Canadian Heritage collecting the resources and focusing the Canadian Heritage Department on Canada's heritage rather than just being a spigot for kicking out loans and grants to to differing uh, organizations I think it's it's a uh, correct course of action for a government heading towards yeah. its hundred. I, I think it's a, a terrific initiative uh, and remember join the consultations because it's your history and it's your museum. Thanks very much to James Moore, Canada's Heritage Minister, for joining us for this discussion.